Hello and welcome to our webinar on top tips on teaching Cambridge IGCSE combined and coordinated sciences. I'm Tamsin Hart from Cambridge University Press and I'll be hosting this webinar for our speaker David. Thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to give attendees a little time to join the webinar before we start. If you'd like to chat to one another and let us know which country you're joining us from, please feel free to use the chat box. It'd be great to hear from you. While you're waiting, I'm going to launch a poll to find out about your main teaching challenges in the classroom. It'd be very interesting to see what answers we get. If I haven't included your main challenge, you can add this to the chat and see if your fellow attendees have similar challenges. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna end that poll and I'm going to share the results. So let's see, what have we got here? What are the biggest challenges for everyone? I think coming out on top, we've got practical lessons at 47%. Then we have supporting differentiation in the classroom at 39%, swiftly followed by applying effective teaching approaches at 36 and planning my lessons at 33. Those are the top ones coming out. Thank you so much everyone for participating. Those are some very interesting results. And thank you very much for joining the webinar today. Let me now hand over to David. Thank you, Tamsin. <clears throat> that was uh, a very interesting poll result, uh, particularly um, exciting actually, that many of you are looking to gain further insight into how to deliver aspects of practical work with your learners today. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that I can say a few words about that. Let me get started. So thank you very much again. Um, Tamsin, thank you for the introduction. And from wherever you are joining us today, welcome. It could be a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, or even a good night, I suppose. Um, my name is David Martindale. I'm the head of science in a large international school at which we have taught the combined and coordinated science courses for many years. I had the privilege of writing the uh, new, or part of the new textbook for Cambridge University Press. And um, <clears throat> that hit the sh hits the shelves very shortly, actually. It's the one with the big moon on the front cover. And I'll show you a few snippets from that textbook later in this session. Uh, I've worked for many years in terms of professional development, and it, it may well be that you and I have crossed paths before, perhaps in a training a session face to face, or maybe on, on, on one of our online sessions. But um, if I haven't met you before, um, welcome. If I have met, have met you before, uh, nice, to, nice to meet you again. Okay, we're going to begin with a, a fairly active way of just getting warmed up, really. We have an hour together, um, but we want to make sure there's enough time at the end for questions. I also want to make sure there's opportunities for you to give feedback and just to make sure that your expectations of the session today align with mine. Uh, I want to play a quick game, and that is to guess the objectives. So we have three here. This is ideally what we're going to cover in the next 40 minutes before our questions. If you could, please, in the chat box, write down the letter A, B or C. You can even do all three if you want to. And then write down what word you feel would be most appropriate that's missing in those three objectives. So you could write down A and then uh, better, although grammatically that wouldn't be very, very good at all but just to give you an idea of what to do. So I'll give you a couple of moments now, and I'll be very interested, and I know Tamsin will report back to me, what do you expect to gain from this webinar? Give you a few moments to add some thoughts. We've got answers coming in already, David. So effective and engaging and practical, more effectives, quite a few effectives. Very nice. And attractive. Excellent. How about for B? Oh, and we had an interesting come in. Now we've got B, effective and active. So A, student-led and inquiry-based, B, formative, and then we've got C for design. And exciting, interesting, understandable, active, engaging. Well, <laughs> to, to achieve all that in 40 minutes, I, I will try my best, but certainly they do chime with a lot of what I'm hoping to do today. And this is also my sort of subtle way of trying to work out if you can all hear me effectively. Um, if the internet does drop out, 
Uh, just be patient for a few moments. I'm sure you'll be able to rehear me again uh, if it's an issue with mine or yours. But that's very, very, very eff effective as, as a means by which to engage people at the beginning of a webinar, because I think in the main, it does align nicely. Um, we're going to be looking at active learning strategies, but effective and active do go hand in hand, of course. Formative assessment. Uh, we will spend a short period of time on that. <clears throat> Formative is a very, very effective way of um, assessing our students for purposes of designing our lessons and planning, which was the word that was missing, but it does uh, act as a synonym in many ways for, for, for what, what, what Tamsin mentioned a moment ago as well. I hope we cover everything that's on the, on the slide here. Let's see how we do. My other intention today is to share with you a few um, screenshots of the new resources from Cambridge University Press for the new syllabus for combined and coordinated science, a course I know very well indeed. So the syllabus is new, <clears throat> excuse me, and it is, um, it's available now and you can download it. It's been, it's been downloadable for some time via the Cambridge International website. Uh, it's for 2025, six and seven in terms of when the exams are sat. So the first exam will be um, for students in India in March 2025. So that means there will be some people teaching the course either now or very, very soon to enter their students into um, that exam series. It is quite a different syllabus. Quite a lot has been removed, quite a lot has been added, and there has been a bit of realignment and rephrasing. We're not going to have the time in this session to look at every change. That would take many hours. It's very important, however, that you do uh, reflect the changes that have been made in your scope and sequence documents and uh, teaching plans. So let's have a think about how we can use the upcoming resources to, um, to better teach the new syllabus and some of the changes that have been made. Well, then, like I said, the new resources from Cambridge are distinguishable in that they have a big uh, moon on the front. And that does tell you something. Space science is now part of the combined and coordinated science courses, <clears throat> which wasn't there before. So space science is something that we are now going to bring into the teaching and learning of students. <clears throat> Still, excuse me. Unfortunately, I <clears throat> contracted COVID last week and I'm still getting over it. Um, as you can see, this is brand new and these are available very soon. What you'll find online now on the Cambridge University Press website is you'll find a document that looks a bit like this. This shows you a nice distilled version of some of the edits that have been made to the new syllabus. Um, general changes, for example, um, are on uh, the first row. And you can see here that um, there are some fairly generic suggestions, such as the assessment model has not changed at all, which is nice. Um, but some subtle ones like um, energy and the uh, use of the term energy and how it differs between the three sciences. And then we get into some of the biology changes down the bottom here. For example, a new topic, drugs, has been included, which mostly reflects antibiotic use. Active transport has been included, but other aspects have been removed. And you'll find these uh, on the second page here. And again, this can be downloaded from the Cambridge University Press uh, website. Um, the reason that some of these um, concepts and, and phenomena and topics have been removed is complex. It's something that we can explore another time. It's partly to ensure that we, we, we don't um, expect uh, teachers like myself to go over the guided learning hours with students in the classroom, but, but some of them reflect cultural sensitivities as well, particularly in the biology syllabus. Chemistry, you can see there's a few changes to be made. Some reflect combined, some reflect coordinated um, topics that we're familiar with, like um, uh, sulfur, carbonates, nitrogen and fertilizers, they've been removed, but other topics have been added, such as titration. Uh, and so on. And the same thing for physics here. Um, space physics is perhaps the most eye-catching inclusion, but there are um, other aspects such as dispersion of light, for example, which has now found its way into the syllabus. Um, but there are aspects that are now gone, such as um, uh, effects of forces and so on. So of course, there's not enough time in this webinar for us to go through these one by one, nor for me to be able to say to you, 
this is exactly how to reconfigure your teaching plans to reflect the changes because of course we all work in different schools with different demands we may have different numbers of lessons every week so it is a very personal thing that you'll need to be doing before you start teaching this course how you reconfigure the teaching plan to ensure that you're not teaching things that are not going to be examined and that you're teaching things that will now be examined and potentially in a different way. So throughout the, the majority of this presentation today, I will refer to the new resources and you'll spot a few uh, screenshots as we go. We have three different parts to today's webinar. The first is active learning. And I'm gonna spend just a few moments refreshing all of our um, memories and, and, and awareness of what active learning means. Of course, we, most of us will probably knee-jerk reaction respond, the classroom on the left is better because students are talking and talking is good in classrooms. That's what we're led to believe and students doing things. And that's obviously very good as well because that's what we're led to believe from the research. And this is all true. Uh, students being able to engage with dialogue and learn meaning of science in their own way is very important. I would suggest that the classroom on the right-hand side is very important in science as well there must be a degree of independent study. Ours is a subject which, not unlike many others, of course, um, requires learning of huge numbers of key terms and, and concepts. And it is impossible for students to make their own meaning of everything. There must be a degree of teacher-led activity and teacher-led um, instruction, but to have a mixture is the most appropriate way of teaching combined and coordinated science. Our job is not to fill students' minds with information like you would fill a bucket with water. It is instead to provide the right conditions um, to allow students to make their own meaning of the terms and concepts. It's to help them grow. Because the traditional mode of instruction, of teaching, looked a bit like this. And to an extent, it does still work. But active learning, as we all, I hope, are aware, because active learning has been a concept and a theory for many, many years now. Um, and there's a whole way to work behind it uh, that suggests that by building their own knowledge and understanding, students make greater gains. They must do something in lessons. So if you are looking at this table on the board here and thinking that the majority of my teaching at this level, IGCSE, conforms to statements on the left, my students learn by memorization and my classrooms are very quiet and making mistakes is a negative thing. Well, consider borrowing some of the statements from the right now and again. And consider how um, engaging students with hands-on learning and collaborative work, um, providing intentional opportunities for mistakes and hoping they make the mistakes so that they can learn from them. These are all methods by which we can make our teaching more active and this is something that permeates throughout the Cambridge pathway but I think is particularly important at IGCSE because at IGCSE we are probably at the most critical point of inspiring students to make choices about their future um, studies and careers because one that when they specialize further a level or alternatives they, they, they often restrict what they can then do at university. So making sure that motivation is high and making sure that uh, their awareness of the relevance of the science to the wider world is, is, is distinct is very important. And to those who argue that active learning strategies might not benefit students as much as those who are receiving entirely passive teaching techniques such as you know rote learning and endless past paper practice um, when it comes around to the exams which we're not going to speak much about today there is lots of evidence that in terms of retention and ability on assessments active learning does make a big difference and um, again we don't have time to look into this on this occasion but just look at the slide here the more active a method is when you go from the top to the bottom, uh, the greater the retention, the greater the motivation to learn and the greater the, essentially the, the, the outcome, um, academic outcome of the student. 
So there's a degree of both. And I think, I, I hope I've made that clear. Science teaching, IGCSE in particular, we have to be very clear about things. We have to give students a very, very uh, clear idea of what they need to know and how they are going to come to learn it. But what's also very important is we provide them with opportunities for, the, for them to make their own meaning of that material. There's lots of things you can do if active learning is something that you want to explore, which are not going to change entirely the way you teach. There are lots of activities that you can explore, and many of them are shown here. Think, pair, share uh, is something which, if you were to Google it, you would find lots of very good explanations. It's very, very quick. What's the question is one of my favourite activities as a starter or a plenary, where you give students an answer and then challenge them to give you a question that could be applied for that answer. So um, in biology, for example, I could state carbon dioxide and I would challenge students to give me a question for which carbon dioxide is the answer. I might even make it completely combined or coordinated and encourage them to think of ways in which they could generate chemistry or physics questions for that answer. Conversion of information from text into a picture or vice versa. Our subjects are full of visual stimuli. Think about any topic in your specialist subject, biology, chemistry, or physics. Immediately, I'm sure an image springs to mind. Uh, it's almost impossible to study science without imagery. And I would suggest that that's a really underutilized part of our course. We perhaps ought to encourage students to actively convert information from diagrams to text and back again more often as a way of making active meaning of things. Summarizing content is quite nice, but taboo is what I want to focus on for a moment before we start to explore some of the resources. Taboo is quite a nice activity, and it's a nice way to introduce some active learning to your classrooms. So here, and I'm sure many of you have heard of this idea, what we do is we give students um, a word or a series of words. They work in groups or small, small groups, pairs, potentially, or even online if it's home-based learning. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. And um, they have to describe the meaning of one of these key terms to appear without using a number of other key term terminology points. So think about electrolysis. How could you describe the concept of electrolysis to somebody, but without using the terms electrode, electrolyte, or current? It would be difficult, but that's the point. It's forcing students to reconsider their vocabulary and consider a bit more deeply their knowledge of the topic and whether they really know it and, and really have internalized it. What's more, students enjoy this. If you were to use it every lesson, it might start to get a little bit tiring. But now and again, for a starter or a plenary, it's a very effective way of getting students to talk. And we'll come back to that idea later in this webinar. Okay, so before I sh show you a few resources, I'd like to just very quickly um, ask you to contribute to the chat box again to, to partly give you a little bit of a break from my voice for a few moments. Um, could you please rank order the following five tasks in the order of activity um, that you feel reflects their uh, activeness, if you like, in the classroom? So if you felt that designing a laboratory investigation was probably the most active way of learning, out of these five, you would put that number as number two. And your second choice would be make a poster, it would be number four. And if you think that number three, listening to a lecture, is the least active, please put number three as your last. I suggest that's not a bad suggestion that I've got there on the board as an example, but you might disagree. I'll just give you a few moments, and then perhaps in a moment, Tamsin, you could just read out maybe a, a couple of uh, sets of five numbers for me, just to give me a flavour of how we're doing. Yes, of course. See, if you've got any ideas, would you like to pop those in the chat box and I'll read them out to David. So we started with a two and then a two, four, one, three, five, two, one, three, five, four. We've got three at the start here, followed by a five, then two, five, four, one, three, two, one, four, five, three, two, four, one, five, three, 41253, another 42513. Okay. Getting some uh, themes coming up. Yeah, we are. And I, 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 I'm quite surprised actually. A couple of couple of people have completely um, um, 
uh, written complete opposites, which is fascinating. I think making a poster is one of those that could be completely passive. You know, ask students to just group around a piece of poster paper and, you know, don't give them much instruction. And, and it, it might be a very, very passive activity where they're just cutting out information from newspapers or, or printing things out and sticking it on. Or it could be very, very active. It depends on how we phrase them. Thanks, Tamsin. And thanks for contributions. Again, it was my subtle way of making sure that you could all hear me as well. Um, I, there is no correct answer to this. There's, it depends on what you do with these activities. On the surface, listening to a lecture sounds very passive, the opposite of active. You know, listening to a lecture, students might, you know, completely on my classes on occasion. Um, designing a laboratory investigation, number two was rated as very active by many of you. It depends on the context. You know, it could it could be a very passive activity if you simply ask them to do that for homework under pressure. But what I would say is it's likely that um, because you're getting them to synthesize and um, create something, it's, it's, it's making them more minds on. So realistically, you know, you're going to roll your eyes when you see this slide because there is no correct answer. It depends on the context. Any task can be active. Um, Answering extended response questions in small groups with each member responsible for a different part would make it extremely active. It would promote collaboration. Designing a laboratory investigation using a list of equipment where they could select from the house. I mean, that's, again, it's making things more active in a perhaps individual setting. Encouraging students to listen to lectures, and I don't like that word very much, but while completing a missing word worksheet to reinforce what is covered would engage them with active listening because they're consistently being primed and prompted to contribute in their own way. Um, and there are, there are others here, which I'll, I'll let you read on your own, but I think it's wrong for us to assume that any task should be banned from our class. This is the point behind the resources. Cambridge University Press have put together some new resources, which I'm gonna show you um, now, I'll show you some screenshots from. Of course, these can be used in a million different ways in your classroom. You can use them as a stimulus, you can use them as they're intended to, you could use them in a completely different way. Uh, um, these, there's a famous phrase, these are not your handcuffs, they are simply a skeleton for you to then build upon. So here is, for example, a double page spread from the biology section of the course book. You can see here that we've got on the left hand side a section in blue, which I think I've expanded here. And there's an activity actually in the course book, which is directing students to engage in an active um, pursuit. Um, it's there and it's ready and waiting and you can use it. You don't have to use it. You could adjust it. But there are opportunities in the course book that prompt students to actively engage with their learning, which I think is very refreshing. And it, it's not something that you would see in a, in a course book from maybe even 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And this is something which I think is very, very exciting. This is a uh, section from the workbook, on the physics part of the um, new workbook. Uh, you have to be a little bit more imaginative with some of the workbook activities because the workbook activity is perhaps going to be used more often by students for independent study. Uh, but this is prompting students, as you can see, to carry out some research online. And um, to make it more active, you could encourage students to work in you know, buddies, pairs. They could, they could produce something which is uh, a combined submission. And that would generate a lot more collaboration and active learning. OK, so in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the second part of our presentation today, and that is uh, formative assessment. And how can the resources be best used to uh, help us better formatively assess our students? <clears throat> Very briefly, formative assessment versus summative assessment. What I tend to say relating to this slide or slides like this is think of the extreme types of formative and summative assessment. So the most extreme summative assessment is the assessment that's carried out by examiners that students and teachers will never meet. It's carried out um, after the exam season 
and um, even the examiners will never know the names of the students whose exams they're marking. It's literally all about the grade. That's an extreme version of summative assessment. An extreme version of formative assessment <clears throat> is probably the type of things you might say to a student in the corridor, even outside of the classroom, you know, remarking upon a contribution they made in class last week or, or giving them some feedback on a piece of work that you've, you've marked and you're yet to hand back. It's, it's not written down, it's, it's vocal, it's never recorded, but that is much more powerful on a day-to-day -day basis for our students' learning. And what's more, it helps us uh, plan our lessons more effectively because if we are gaining information from our students about the uh, point in their learning, then we're able to make some adjustments perhaps to where we're going to take them next. Written feedback um, like this is not particularly effective. A student who gets 18, we, we're gonna presume out of 20, uh, might just sit back and think they've done enough, but I would like them to think, how could I have got those extra two marks? Um, good, of course, doesn't help that student improve any further. If that was 18 a percent, well, I suppose good would not be written, but at that end of the spectrum, the student is unlikely to reflect on their work. If they're just given a simple score of 18 percent, it will probably be screwed up and put in their bag. So we have to be very mindful of what feedback we provide our students. And there's lots of evidence, and I'm sure you're aware of this, of how effective written commentary can be when it comes to giving students feedback. What's the very best way of giving students written feedback? Well, it seems to be giving them a comment and a point to action. So tell them what they can do next. This has a very strong positive impact. Of course, provide them with their score, their grade, but that might be subsequently, maybe after they've considered your written feedback, maybe the following lesson, or maybe just a few minutes or a few hours after. Ideally, feedback written should be positive. It should tell learners where they are in their learning. That often reflects on what went well or WWW. And it should also tell students how they could improve. Sometimes referred to as even better if, EBI. And these two acronyms can be very, very useful in, in education, particularly when it comes to providing uh, written feedback particularly on exam style questions or um, extended response questions. Because if you're anything like me, I would love to give more written feedback to my students, but I just don't have time. However, at least once a term, I do take a piece of work in from them that I give a lot of written feedback to, uh, upon. And uh, I do it maybe just once a term to set the standard for the dialogue that I expect from my students when it comes to discussing how to improve. Doing that once a term just reminds them that feedback is a two-way process. And sometimes these acronyms can save me a little bit of time. So for example, I might write down WWW, um, excellent use of key terminology. EBI, uh, you have misinterpreted the command term. And then having given that back to students, they can very easily see how they can you know, go beyond what they've already written. Um, and they're more likely, I think, to come and ask me for further clarification if they need it. Um, AFL is another term, um, assessment for learning, which means the same thing as formative assessment. And again, I just wanted to give you a, a little activity that you could do beyond written feedback for your students that allows you to determine the point at which they are in their learning. It's one of my favourite activities. It's only a short thing that you can do during a starter or a plenary maybe halfway through a lesson as a hinge point. But what this does allow is it allows you to walk around the room and listen. And I don't think I do that enough in my teaching. I try and do it more as, 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 I'm, as I'm getting older. Uh, um, but listening to students rather than speaking is as important as anything else. So providing them with three key terms, maybe solid, liquid, gas. It's a very straightforward example and saying to them, I would like you in your pairs or your threes or your groups to think of ways in which each one of those could be the odd one out or the most dissimilar to the other two. So for example, solids have a fixed shape, neither liquids nor gases have a fixed shape. Um, compression can only happen with gases. 
but you'll be surprised at how imaginative some students are and they really do enjoy this almost competition of trying to work out ways in which each of these three terms are the odd one out. But the most important thing for me is that I'm able to walk around the room and listen for misconceptions, listen for uh, misinterpretations and build that into my subsequent lesson planning. So how do the new resources help in terms of formative assessment? Well, this is where I have to draw, draw, draw us back to what I said earlier about how we have to be imaginative with our resources. Uh, Cambridge assessment can't, of course, um, provide you yet, although it might happen one day, I can imagine, uh, with opportunities to automatically formatively assess students. But we have to use our own professional awareness of how to do that in our, in our classes. But there are some explicit activities that you can use, and some of them relate to self-evaluation. You'll find this in the course book. This is from the chemistry section. And it's quite common throughout the course book where students are provided with a series of statements related to can, I can, and they are challenged to reflect on whether they actually have mastered that or not. It takes a little bit of work at the beginning, but it is worth doing. And some students sometimes will roll their eyes and think, oh no, it's that self-evaluation time. But, but all of them, I think, get out of this an awareness of um, the extent to which they need to build their knowledge to make a success of their course. Um, the challenge for us is how we then snapshot this information and record it. Uh, I would suggest it's something that you can do by asking students to make a copy of this table um, and then you know, submitting it to you as a quick flick through. Opportunities to um, self-assess or peer assess students' work are also present in the new resources. And you'll find this in the biology section of the uh, workbook. I believe it's all about um, drawing a plant cell. And you can see here that students are challenged to self-assess their work and then reflect upon what mark they got and how they can improve upon it. This is quite common and it's good practice. It really helps them out when it comes to more independent learning later on in their education. OK, so we're making good time. Just to remind you that in about 10 minutes, um, we're going to um, wind up the official slideshow, but we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. I can see that questions have popped up, but uh, I'm not going to answer any questions until about 45 minutes past the hour or quarter past the hour if you're if you're in India. Um, but uh, just to make you aware, that we have about 10 minutes left until the questions can begin. The third and final part of our slideshow today is to look at how we can best plan our lessons, particularly in light of the new resources and the new syllabus. OK, so we're going to consider um, one topic here, and that's transpiration. I've chosen a fairly challenging section from the core and supplements section of the combined and coordinated science course transpiration in plants what do we need to be aware of when we're planning a lesson well here's a snapshot you can see that we have as usual with cambridge syllabus for igcse core and supplement uh, the supplement is only to be taught to students who are going to be entered for the extended exams uh, papers two and um, four you can see here that we have two outcomes on the supplement explaining the effects of rate of transpiration and also explain how and why wilting occurs. So we have to identify the learning objectives first of all. Now the learning objectives can be drawn straight into the syllabus. Let's have a look. They must be measurable. So it's not right to say um, how know about the process of transpiration because how do we assess that? How do we quantify that? It's not possible. What is better is if we state, describe and explain, and you'll notice that these are command terms that I've included here. It makes it much more quantifiable in terms of how we would assess this content. The problem with the first measuring uh, outcome is that it's just not measurable at all. We can't peer into students' brains and work out whether they know something, but we can challenge them with questions, we can challenge them with activities that help us determine whether they can state, describe or explain. The problem with the last two, of course, is that there is a bit of overlap 
describing and explaining in science is very, very, very um, difficult for some students because they can sometimes explain when they mean describe and they can sometimes describe when they mean explain. And there's an activity you can do, many of them, which you can find online, which encourage students to describe and explain objects or patterns that have nothing to do with the subject they're studying. So here we have two flags. Uh, encouraging students to make a statement and it is, uh, it ask them to describe them and then explain the patterns really helps them understand the difference but that's something which really is for another day but i would i would encourage you to explore your students awareness of these uh, command terms not only for assessment purposes but also for your planning purposes so that they're aware of what they need to do i feel i always need to spend a moment on this uh, this is the south korean flag so a state, you would just simply say South Korea. Description, well, you'd have to talk about the circle in the middle and the colors and the, the shapes and the, the white background. This is all a description, of course. And the explanation is when it gets a little bit higher on the Bloom's taxonomy pyramid. And we'd have to do a bit of internet research to find out what the white background means. I believe it's the land. The circle is the people and these symbols are the government, but that is, completely separate to science and in many ways it's more powerful if you were to get your students to think about their country's flag or a national dish it can really help them with this um, distinguishing so once you've identified what they want to uh, what you want them to learn well they're going to have to start thinking about how we're going to teach them this or rather probably better to say how we're going to help them learn this an introduction to the lesson really ought to in, in, include some uh, establishment of prior knowledge. And don't forget that students will come from a range of backgrounds. They might have been in your school for a long time, but they might have heard different stories in the news that morning that have an impact on their science awareness. Uh, sharing learning intentions that we've just spoken about, making that a part of your lesson, I think is quite important, even if it's fairly subtle and you don't display them making students aware of what you're going to do with them during a typical lesson is important. But I think what's very important also is creating an enthusiasm for learning and giving them something which prompts their motivation, I think is important. It could be an interesting picture on the board as they walk in. Some of the most effective starter activities in, that I've ever seen have been when a teacher just puts a really interesting screenshot or a photograph on the board. And as students walk in, they're immediately talking about it. You know, it could be a, could be a, a moon landing. It could be a Venus flytrap. It could be a um, anything. You know, a student, you'll be surprised at how quickly students start wondering about what they're going to be doing today, and, and then how many questions pop up at the beginning. It's it's, it's quite a quite a simple but effective strategy to begin a lesson, rather than students walking in and taking five minutes to unpack their bags and catching up over the weekend. Um, variety is the key term from this slide, making sure that the lesson is broken up into a number of chunks. And in a minute, I'll show you the uh, teacher resources that Cambridge University Press have published for this course. And this makes, your, makes our jobs very, very easy in that regard. The number of activities that are provided for us to choose from, if you want to choose from them, is, is, is huge. Um, this is one of them, and you'll spot this throughout the teacher resources because I, I had the privilege of contributing to the biology ones. Um, but encouraging students in plenary activities, for example, to synthesize information and work at that very, very top level of the Bloom's taxonomy pyramid is very important. I think this is a very, very good strategy to help that. What many of my own students find difficult, because English is not their first language, is actually remembering the words. And if you think about it, that is quite a low level skill. It's down the bottom, it's recall of the pyramid. It's assessment objective one. If you looked in the syllabus, that's where you'll find it. But if you were to provide them with those key terms, I know it feels like we're helping them a bit too much, but bear with me. If you provide them with those key terms and say, right, I'd like you to write a sentence or a paragraph with them, then you can really find out a bit more about what they're capable of in terms of ability to explain synthesize and apply so it's helping them demonstrate their assessment objective two skills 
which um, in, um, in the end perhaps matter more. Um, it's helping them be aware of science as a, as a discipline. Of course, one day they'll have to internalize these key terms. It's vital that they know them. It's the language of science and assessments are important and that there'll be a number of marks awarded. But being able to use them is what I want to find out about as well. And removing that obstacle in my class is important now and again, giving students the keywords and asking them to use them in a short paragraph, um, which you can easily differentiate by varying the number of words you provide. So throughout this presentation, and we're coming, coming to the end now, um, you've heard quite a lot, I think. I've tried to cram quite a lot into this 45 minutes, but those three examples I mentioned, uh, taboo, odd one out, and the last one to do with um, incorporation of key terms, allow us to walk around and listen. And don't underestimate the, the, the importance of listening during a very busy classroom experience. It's not a problem if we're not speaking very much in a, in a particular class now and again. What's important is that we are gaining information from our students as much as we're giving them information. So how can we use our new resources to help plan lessons? Well, again, it's quite straightforward. There are opportunities here, as you can see, that prompt students to discuss things. This is from the physics section of the course book. You'll spot on the bottom right that there are some really, really interesting discussion questions you could use as starter activities. You could ask students to read that passage prior to the lesson or even at the beginning of the lesson. And what a, an incredibly rich uh, discussion it could be for the first five minutes. Uh, there are projects included in the uh, new resources. And these projects uh, could be extended over a, a number of weeks, perhaps. You could set a little bit of um, work every week to, for students to work on projects, which gives them a really good sense of how the, the discipline of science is applied to the real world and makes things a lot more holistic. Truly coordinated science teaching is, is, is possible through these projects. Uh, within the workbook, you'll also find opportunities um, to help you plan lessons. There are nice little um, extended activities as well, uh, which you can use as uh, at different points in, in your class. But I think the icing on the cake for planning would be this resource. This is the digital teachers resource which if you've, if you've got access to, gives you uh, for every topic, a number of really important and really very valuable um, aspects such as, you know, what are the most common misconceptions in this topic? This is self-structure, for example. You've got starter ideas, you've got main teaching ideas, um, you've got practical um, opportunities. And I think this is where I wanted to bring up the practical aspect of the course. Um, there are lots and lots of practical uh, instructions in this digital teacher resource that link with um, the course book. So in terms of practical guidance, particularly for, for those of you, including me, who teach one of, the, one of these three subjects, which is not really our specialism. In my case, it would probably be the physics that I'm least comfortable with. It does give you a lot of guidance as to how to conduct these investigations and these practical activities. So if, if biology is perhaps of the three subjects you're, you're least um, secure, I can guarantee that within this section, there's lots of really effective um, pointers um, because I had the privilege of writing it. Okay, so at um, the point at which we are, which is about 15 minutes away from uh, us finishing today, I just wanted to just briefly say thank you for listening so far. We haven't yet finished, we've got an opportunity for questions. Um, there are a few things I would like to mention if we don't have as many questions as, um, as we'd like, but, but I want to just bring in Tams in here at this point, just to, just to let me know if there have been a few that I can address. So thank you for listening so far. I look forward to um, answering a few questions now. Brilliant, thank you so much, David, for that fantastic presentation. It's very much appreciated. Now onto our question and answer section. So giving you the last opportunity now, please can you put any further questions for David into the Q&A box? Okay, let me get started with those questions. Please feel free to add a few whilst I'm talking. Okay, so a really interesting question now. Um, can I ask about effective activities to help my students with error correction? Thank you in advance. 
Thanks, Tamsin. Right, error correction. Um, I'm going to assume we're referring here to making errors in learning rather than perhaps error correction in terms of scientific equipment, because the, the latter one would be a very advanced discussion about scientific apparatus. So error correction in terms of in terms of learning, well, I think making sure that students are aware that making mistakes and errors is something to be welcomed is the most important thing. And, and actually modeling yourself making mistakes is whilst on one hand a little bit unnerving for a teacher because none of us like to make mistakes in front of the class but it is important that they see that even we make mistakes now again but how we then learn from them so now and again i'll put a really challenging six mark question on the board for example and i will try and answer it without having seen the mark scheme and um, it's quite a daunting prospect you think well, goodness me maybe i'll only get like one mark out of six but um i mean i'd pick something that i'm fairly fairly familiar with um, but then we'd have a look at the marks as a class and we'd say, well, OK, well, I've missed this point. Um, but of course, I should have got that because a few weeks ago we looked at this, didn't we, in class and helping students really just understand that, you know, mistakes and mistake making, errors and error making is a really welcome part of learning and nobody's perfect. I mean, the, the point is with Cambridge is that the standards are set extremely high so that we can identify and reward people who who are working at extremely high levels but you know everybody has the opportunity to progress and i think that's a very important point to make to our learners um, if you're brave enough show them how when you make mistakes you can learn from them as well brilliant thank you david um now our next question um can you give me some examples of the fourth feedback shown in the slide so I missed that word before feedback. Uh, so it was the fourth feedback that was shown on the feedback slide. The fourth, fourth or fourth? Sorry. Fourth, um, number four. Number four, fourth. fourth feedback. Okay, let's, let's rewind. I'm not quite sure what the fourth feedback, oh, this one, maybe it was this one. Comment and action, could be this one. I'll assume it's this one. Okay, so comment and action, um, strong positive impact. Well, what this relates to is uh, written feedback mostly. So when we're giving commentary back to our students on, you know, maybe a, a test paper or, or a piece of extended writing, what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't provide them with a mark, a numerical score or grade initially. We should write down a comment, which ideally should revolve around these two acronyms, what went well and even better if. And this really helps students identify how they could improve further. The point with this slide here is that if you were to give them just a numerical or, or letter grade and nothing else, it has almost zero impact on a student's ability to identify how to improve. Uh, and sometimes it can really demotivate them if it's a poor grade. So a comment and action. I mentioned one example, but let me think of another one. Uh, let's say, for example, a student's drawn a, um, uh, a diagram. Let's say that they've written up a practical investigation, they've drawn a diagram. If it showed all of the apparatus required and uh, it was all in the right place, this would not be a, an exam style situation, of course. I would, I would give them some praise. I would say, well done, you've included everything. WWW, all items shown. But maybe the, the quality of the diagram is poor. Maybe they have uh, overlooked uh, including some key annotations and I would probably simply put EBI details relating to um, you know the, the, the relating to aspects of the measurement are missing perhaps um, but I'll, I'll keep it brief the point is that none of us have time to write a huge amount on students work every week but doing it once every term I think is quite important and useful because like I said it generates this idea of dialogue in feedback and Nine times out of 10, a student will come to me and seek clarification about what I meant relating to that feedback. And I think that's a good thing because it promotes this idea that um, the teacher shouldn't be just correcting things. We should be identifying how students can further improve and helping them to do that as well. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, now, um, a comment upon one of the activities. This is interesting. My young learners really liked odd one out activity <laughs> I designed. How about teenagers how can i make my activities related to odd one out more engaging to the students 
Yeah, good question. Yeah, younger learners. I mean, I, I, I must admit also that, you know, the overuse of some of these activities can reduce their effectiveness. So you'd want to do it now and again. And often I find that uh, these little formative or active uh, pursuits can be used when you've got a spare five minutes at the end of a lesson. And, you know, one option is just to you know, let the students do nothing. The other option is to do something a bit more meaningful. And, and even with the older learners, I find that if there's enough challenge here, they will engage. I mean, solid liquid gas is very, very low level. You know, it's, this, it's almost nothing um, novel that I can bring to the table in, in relation to how they could be the odd one out. But if I was to think of something a bit more high level, um, I'm going to have to go my own specialist subject here, but transpiration, translocation and osmosis, you know, thinking about how they are the odd, how different terms there are the odd one out would really motivate, I would say, some of my teenage learners, uh, particularly if they know that you're walking around and listening, particularly if they know that it is almost a badge of honour um, and you'll, you'll, you know, raise your eyebrows and nod um, that they've got something that you hadn't thought of. They can be motivated a lot by the body language that you display as you're walking around and listening. So I'd say it, it is very contextual based and don't overuse it. But it is something that um, does remind us that dialogue and uh, collaboration should play a very important part in our classes. Great. Thank you, David. Um, now, can you recommend some ways to help me design vocabulary activities using defining skill effectively? My students, secondary mm. and high school, sometimes have difficulty with guessing words based on the definitions. Thanks a lot. OK, well, thank you for the question. Um, well, the good news, I think it's good news, is that the command term define has now almost disappeared from the syllabus. You'll find only describe in its place. And I think that's a positive step because define is quite rigid in its expectations, or at least teachers and learners have assumed it has been in the past. You know, there's only one definition of a um, proton, where it's only one definition of weight. And that's not true. There's, there's a hundred different ways of defining those two terms. So description is now what we're looking for. And questions ultimately that require students to understand and to demonstrate their understanding of a key term in such a way uh, would allow a huge variety, I think, uh, of, of, of responses. In terms of how, how students can better internalize descriptions or should we say definitions of of key terms i'm in the same situation as you to an extent i've got a lot of students for whom english is in some cases their third or fourth language um, what's quite important is that you allow them to actively translate those terms into their um, you know, mother tongue language their original family language uh, and qu query them about their exact meaning of the term in that language and ask them to then describe it back to you in a different way, perhaps. Um, it's very difficult because science terms sometimes have very different meanings in different languages. And thankfully the new syllabus does try to address that by qualifying terms such as energy a bit more clearly than it has in the past. Uh, crosswords is a very effective way. And most students do quite enjoy a crossword. Uh, giving them a crossword to help them, you know, provide, provide them with a crossword, which they can then fill in. And the clues are obviously very good descriptions of the key terms. And then, and then requiring them to uh, keep a copy of that crossword, which is essentially a really good definition, definitions sheet. Uh, but activities like that can be quite useful where you're making students think actively about what key terms mean, rather than just saying, well, here's a list, learn them. Uh, and then keeping the record of that learning is very important as well. Great, thank you. Um, now, if listening to a lecture could be an active learning, then as per retention rate pyramid, why are the percentage retention shown as less? So why is it considered mm. as passive learning? Yeah, no, good question. Um, let's have a look. So yeah, lecture 5%. Well. I'm assuming that this study, which I did read a long time ago, it was a long time ago, I'm assuming that this study literally did qualify lecture as a situation where uh, learners were 
passively listening, as opposed to the example I mentioned, which was to reconfigure a lecture so that you provide them with something to do during the experience. I think it's all about imagination here. And again, lecture is probably not the best term because nobody wants to think of their science lessons as a lecture. There are periods of time, however, where because of the nature of our subject, and it's not all intuitive, and it is very objective at times, we have to tell students the facts. We have to say, this is what is true. You know, this, this is what scientific evidence suggests. Um, there are ways that you can bring that to life later, but you must tell them things now and again. And during those moments, it's very important that you think of ways to keep them active because telling somebody something doesn't mean that they're either listening or that they'll understand it. So providing them an opportunity to complete a missing word exercise, for example, as you're providing a short uh, presentation or providing students an opportunity to convert a five minute presentation that you deliver into a short tweet, you know, condensing the information or converting what you're saying into a little diagram. That's really effective. That really does make it a lot more active. So it's, it's making the listening active. And again, it requires a lot of planning. But once you've done it, you can then recycle it. And as you get through your teaching career, uh, you'll find that you can reuse resources and, and strategies that you've made in the past. The key is trying to keep the energy to make and develop uh, new ways of new ways of delivering material. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Now, our final question. Many chemistry activities are not easy to carry out in schools. Are there alternative ways? Right. Good question. All very good questions. Um, yes, there are. Well, to an extent, there are some chemistry practicals which either require uh, quite hard to get resources or um, could present danger, depending on the um, level of behaviour of the class or um, for whatever reason are not advisable to do in your, in your particular context. If that's the case, then I could direct you to the Cambridge Resource Plus Cambridge International Resource Plus platform, which is free of charge. Prior to the pandemic, it did require a fee, but it's now open access if you're a, a Cambridge school and you can access that via the School Support Hub. That is not in any way to be seen as a replacement for first-hand practical activity uh, in the classroom. So I do encourage you to try your very hardest to make sure that you do provide enough practical activities. But I appreciate that now and again, there is a practical that can't be done for whatever reason. The good news is that Cambridge has, like I said, thought hard about those practicals that are less likely to be achieved. And they have provided on this Resource Plus platform some really high quality videos, much better than anything you could find, find on YouTube, um, which are interactive. You can pause and you can stop and you can, you can label diagrams and, and there are resources attached to them. It was something which was very, very, very um, well regarded during the during the worst of the pandemic when schools are in lockdown, and I think it serves a purpose even today in some contexts. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. Um, we have now reached the end of our questions and our time in the webinar today. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Remember that seven days after the webinar, we'll send you an email thanking you for your attendance with a link to the recording of the webinar and the webinar slides. You can use this email as proof of your attendance. To find out more about the resources discussed today, please speak to your sales representative or visit the links my colleagues have been sharing in the chat. Thank you to Karis and Laura for helping us today. And any links that David has mentioned, we will be including in a follow-up blog post. Um, and if you've signed up for our marketing emails, you will be receiving an email about that when it goes live. When the webinar ends, a short survey to complete will open on your screen. So thank you for any answers you provide. So thank you again, David. And good luck to everyone with your teaching and goodbye. Thanks, Tamsin. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>